Now then, you're welcome along. This is week seven of our History of Sports series with Paul Rouse. Paul is a professor at UCD's School of History. He's the author of different books, including Sport and Ireland, A History. And you can find this whole series, we're into week seven, which you can find this whole series. It has its own section now in the Off the Ball Highlights category. So week seven, Paul Rouse. Week seven equals money. Money, money everywhere in the world of sport. Everywhere that you can turn by the end of the Victorian period, the early 20th century, the world of sport is awash with money. We, there's always this idea that the commercialization of sport is something that, that is the product of, of, of our age. And, and it, there is no doubt that the introduction of enormous sums of television money has changed the nature of the relationship between money and sport. But if you look at the construction of our modern world of sport, look at the sporting organizations which still dominate all of those organizations that were constructed at the end of the 19th century. Money was everywhere in their world and they both thrived on money, they sought to create money and they sought to legislate for money. So it's everywhere to be seen. So it's right from the off. And Victorian society, I know you made the point in the notes you sent me, was pretty good from the off at turning leisure, and that includes sport, but leisure into big industry. Well, it is one of those things that the Victorians were brilliant at, was taking uh, the idea of people's spare time and finding ways to make money out of that spare time. So you have to look at what was happening in the wider world at this stage, you get the idea of a regularized working week at the end of, of the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century, the idea that people who worked in factories would work all week and half day on Saturday and then would have Sundays off and be free on Saturday afternoons. So into that space, people sought to make money. And if we look at the great innovations of the Victorian period, you get, it's from this time that the postcard was invented. Obviously, uh, a clear example of photography uh, mid mid twenty uh, mid nineteenth century invention being used and sold to people. You get stuff like fish and chip shops emerging. You get ice cream being sold, cigarettes being sold, mineral water, and the idea of the of the tea shop and and tea trips. And it all a brilliant place to look at how this worked is to look at the seaside seaside towns and the spring up of this idea of a day trip out to the the sea from taking on a train out you go to the seaside. So you see places like. Bray, the development of, of what happened in Bray and the seaside resort of Bray. And you go to the far end of the country to Kilkee in County Clare. And people who are familiar with that town will understand just the attraction of people to that area, walks, and you can still see some of the old buildings from that period where people went day tripping out to the seaside. And that again is uh, um, a Victorian construction. And what really matters here is this is holidays and days out not for an elite of society or not even for middle classes. It was, it was a, an attempt to broaden it out to a wider strand of, of society. It was a, a kind of a popularization of the idea of, mm. of doing this. And more people had more disposable income. I'm not saying everybody had disposable income. There was incredible poverty in Ireland in, during this period. You have, even for example, in Dublin, there were 25,000 families in Dublin who lived in one roomed accommodation. That is, they lived in tenement flats all around the city. That's right. 25,000 families. And many of those families even had lodgers in that one room. And they would, they, be, that, that was a really fragile existence. Hmm. But if you go above that strata of society in Ireland, there was more disposable income available to people. And this was how they, 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 they sought to spend their money on, on weekends. We can think of this Victorian period as a prudish bunch and a serious bunch. And in part, I think that is because the photographs that they all took were very serious. And yet of late, I mean, Twitter is a great thing. There are brilliant accounts you can follow, historical accounts. And I've seen in the last couple of years, almost the outtakes of those photos. So you'll have a couple standing beside each other, dead serious, no affection, no smiles. Uh, presuming uh, they were, I presume they were told to stand very, very still. The technology probably wasn't what it would become clearly. But then there are the outtakes, which are a bit more blurred because they're moving around. But the couple are then laughing and smiling and playing. And well, for I mean, it's a terrible thing they were told to not smile in the photo. But uh, they're clearly a fun-loving type of society as much as any other. Well, it's this illusion of the Victorian straight lace 
society just doesn't wash when you look at the when you go beneath the surface of those photographs and the image that was that was uh, constructed and the rhetoric of people who wished the society to be like that they there were people out there who were trying to create a society where everything was rigid and organized and and ordered and uh, uh, but it's not how it worked and you look at the music halls that were around dublin for example a part of the english music hall culture that spread into dublin and you get stars coming out i believe these are these were people such as the, the Chinese giant and a man who's just called the dwarf and, um, and, and, and the elephant man who people might remember from history. All of these were performers who came and were presented as freak shows and coming around the stage. And this was, this was a music hall culture where Dublin was part of a circuit that included Blackpool and Brighton and all of those English towns. And all around this were two other things that, are, that must be noted. First of all, there were drugs. So opium was relatively widely available and another drug called laudanum was widely used as well and these were these were serious drugs which were available in 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 large quantities around the place number one and number two for all the talk of victorian prudishness there was uh, this was a world that also was filled with pornography so there were various studios who made a lot of money from selling and, and distributing pornographic images during uh, during this period and this this spread into ireland now there was an attempt to 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 regulate that and you see for example two lads on the main street in cork were caught with three photographic three photographic pictures of women which they were sharing with each other at the beginning of the first world war and they, they ended up in a kind of a court case but beyond that there was the illicit distribution of of all of this material and and it was a thriving world uh, within victorian society completely at odds mm. that the image of the image that people would have around it and it is in this context that you must see the commercialization of sport during this period. This is a wider commercialization of leisure, leisure and of people's free time. So where do, you want to, where do we want to start when we talk about money and sport? Uh, the basics, equipment, all that kind of stuff. That, that must be a blossoming industry. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Let's look at the very things that people, people play games with. So if you look at, say, footballs, for example, the making of footballs, hmm. something that was made possible in large numbers by technological changes in the middle of the 19th century which allowed for the mass production of footballs. I mean, if you, you could not have a regular series of football league matches or, or, or any sort of competition unless you had a ball hmm. and several balls at your, at your, at, at your disposal. And so foot, footballs, look at the Gilbert ball, for example. Gilbert was a shoemaker in the middle of rugby town beside rugby school who started to make footballs in the 1830s and 1840s for the boys who were playing in rugby school. And eventually, as the century wore on, the Gilbert shoemaking um, establishment became a Gilbert ball-making establishment. Mm. He understood what was happening. Shilcox in Birmingham, similarly, were producing 50,000 footballs by later in the end of the 15th century, again, having grown from something really small. And all of this spread into Ireland. You look, in, you look in the 1880s and you can see, for example, um, the 1860s, 1870s and 1880s, William Lawrence, who we've spoken about previously, who had this, published this calendar of cricketing matches, also sold sports goods from his shop on Grafton Street. Elveries in 1881, based in the city centre in Dublin, where took out a massive ad saying, we bought 1,400 tennis rackets uh, on the wholesale market and we're selling them in our shop now. And they come in, to the shop and they go out almost straight away. So people are now selling, there are, there are advertisements in newspapers for specially branded hunting gear, for different types of sporting wear, for, for Gaelic footballs as the, as the 1890s roll in, for Harleys that are now being sold. So it goes a long way before he had founded the GEA, Michael Cusick had to organize for Harleys to be cut by a special and brought into Dublin by a man who was doing it or people cut their Harleys from trees and made them themselves mm. but this began to change through the 1880s into the 1890s and well into the 1900s people are now mass producing um, sporting equipment and selling them as part of a retail market mm. for I mean, practitioners you, of the sport though not for supporters yes okay right that doesn't come until later so then there's various aspects. I mean, we've talked about what the rail network did for sport. We've talked about uh, the journalists who suddenly started covering sport. All of that stuff is blossoming around it. I guess if we're talking money and pre-television, which is now the main source of revenue for the bigger clubs, 
the real game changer is this fantastic discovery that people will pay in to see games. Oh yeah, and then big numbers. Now it, we have to say clearly that people were playing in to see cricket in the 1740s and the 1750s. So this was a slow burner, which absolutely exploded in the 1880s and the 1890s and this creation of a culture whereby going to support a team was a matter of civic pride in, 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 in an area in England. And you can see it through soccer and we'll, 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 we can talk about that. But what constructed that world, fundamental to the construction of that world, was the creation of stars and a preview and review culture through the newspapers. So more people being able to read, more people giving, getting access to a national press because they're being distributed on railways mm. and the creation of stars and the advertising around matches and people being told that there was a regular series of games and communication into these newspapers also mattered. So for example, when the races were held in Newmarket, 10,000 telegrams would be sent out of Newmarket through the post office on this given day, given reports of these things and distributed around the post offices of Britain and Ireland. And similar things began to happen in Ireland. So the telegraph wire becomes something as it spreads like a kind of a, a, a spider's web of information across Ireland in the late 19th century, giving information on the results of races, on the results of matches. So that's important mm. as well. But what does it do? It creates an appetite for people not just to play games, but to come and watch games in large numbers. And you can see it in England through soccer matches and rugby matches in the 1880s and into the 1890s and the creation of a league, a football league in England in 1888, which becomes a slow burner at the beginning in the first year. There were only 12 teams in the Football League in England in the first year. And there's an average attendance of about 4,600 per, per match, which is not great. But it, grow, it grows year after year after year. By the eve of the First World War, there are 20 now, 20 teams in two divisions. Or 20 teams in the English first division and more in the second division. And the average attendance per match is now up to 23,100. Wow. Like more than 9 million people play, pay in through the gates. Wow. And it is this construction of a spectator culture and the idea of going to support your team that fills the Saturday afternoons, fills that leisure space of people who pour out of the mines and the factories, of clerical workers who have a weekend off and who come in and they stand on flat cap terraces and, 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 and support their local team. Mm. And the stories go beyond that. And of course, there are people who are selling drink around the ground and outside the ground. There is gambling everywhere. Yeah. The place is absolutely laced with gambling. And you cannot understand the commercialization of sport without understanding the profoundly important nature of gambling to, to everything that went on. But it became a phenomenon to go to matches became a phenomenon to support your team became a phenomenon wow 20,000 uh, plus attendance at I was going to say Premier League games <laughs> but it's not even 20 teams in the first division and 20,000 attendance I mean a Norwich or a Bournemouth life hasn't changed all that much in some respects so how quickly then if you have oh, you know 9 million uh, people coming to watch games across a year how quickly does the Alan Shearer of his day get involved in advertisements and he's uh, in endorsing the local pub and how quickly do things like uh, advertising boardings around pitches come into effect and all of that stuff people realize pretty quickly there's lots of eyeballs yeah it, it's it it begins to gather a, a momentum it's a stone going down the hill that actually collects the mosques as it moves along and you can see it by by 1910 in England, there are 6,800 professional soccer players. Yeah. There are 200 first-class professional cricketers and others playing in local leagues as well. And there are about 400 professional jockeys. So what does that mean for those? There were, as there always are, a couple of stars, a like couple of people who do manage to get right to the cream of them. But for the most of the people who are involved in professional sport, the wages are really low. There are not endorsements. And there's a, there's a brilliant ification of, of this world in, in, that was created in the 1880s and the 1890s of professional soccer, which endured until the 1960s, which is written in just a superb book by a man called Gary Imlach, who wrote a book called um, My Father and Other Working Class Heroes, which is the story of his father, Stuart Imlach, a Scottish international in the 1950s, who played first division football in, in, in England and who every summer 
had to um, he had to take a part pay, to take a part time job. So he works as a painter or whatever he did on on any given summer. And this is a guy who'd become a first division player and a, an international player. That he's always in the cream of it. So professionalism, we have to look at professionalism not in the context of the glamour of a professional soccer player's lifetime or or, or mm. NBA player or something like that. You must look at it in the context of these guys were not play, paid markedly more money than the average workers when it came to the to came to ordinary players. There were always the stars who could get endorsements, who could get their names on top of pubs, who would who would get. Um, so, so for example, there's a there's a, 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 a jockey in the 1880s, Fred Archer, and he was taken on as the person to be the face of Cantrell and Cochran Soda, and his name and face are appeared everywhere, and he got money for that. But he's the exception. Okay. There are another 360, 370 jockeys who are professionals who are just scratching by, and when you see it in Ireland. The professionalization of sport in Ireland, there's no professionalization of rugby. And in terms of soccer, the professionalization of soccer, it's, it happened 10 years after it happened in England. So it happened in the middle of the 1890s. And when it, when it happened in Ireland, there was no mad rush of people to turn professional. There are there are just over 200 within 10 years of soccer professionalizing because the pay is so poor. The training is incredibly boring. There's a huge amount of running. Um, they don't really have they don't do ball skills enormously and it's it's you're held in a, in a kind of a bondage system which means the club owns your registration mm. so it is not a glamorous existence and the very best players go to England uh, but most people don't get paid okay it is an extraordinary thing that the nine, you know, 1995 is when rugby turns professional rugby union that is just it's, it's amazing it stays rugby union yeah amateur for so long like you, uh, in the notes you sent on, in the 1892 Yorkshire Challenge Cup final in rugby, 27,000 people watched Leeds against Halifax. So 27,000 yeah. people. And that same year, there were 25,000 at the FA Cup final. So rugby is a ginormous a spectator sport. Explain to me, I know that we're, we're getting towards the point of the split here, but so we, why was rugby and what became Union. Why was it so intent on preserving its amateur status? Yeah, this is a really, um, it's a tricky enough story to tell because there are a whole lot of things wrapped into it. But what you must remember that in the early 1890s, for all that soccer had grown, for all that soccer had spread massively, and for all that it's the establishment of a football league had drawn huge numbers through the gates, rugby, then not two sports, but one sport, Rugby was hugely popular all across large swathes of Northern England. And there are many reasons for that. Partly because the rugby, many of the clubs, football clubs that were first followed the rugby path rather than the soccer path, number one. Number two, there was no tradition in any of these areas of a game of football being played in which you couldn't handle the ball. So people were used to playing a game in which you took the ball in your hands and, and, and you ran with it or you, you did whatever you did with it. Um, so it is no surprise really that rugby should have been thriving and it really was thriving as a game in the early 1890s with at least 480 clubs affiliated uh, um, around England to the, to, the, to the Rugby Football Union drawing huge crowds in to their, to their big matches. So why was there, why was there a split? Um, why, was, why was there an issue around professionalism? Um, there was a strain within the Rugby Football Union in which, I mean, there's a very large and wide strain in which they did not wish to cede control of the operation of rugby to working class people. These were people who'd come out of the English public school system. And as I think I've made this point to you before, but this great mis misnomer of it being a public school system, it was elite fee-paying schools mm. who controlled the game. These people who left the elite fee-paying schools had taken professional jobs around England they were making plenty of money from their jobs and they didn't want to leave their jobs to go and play professionally when they weren't going to make much money from it. And they liked their jobs and they could see, see what was coming from it. So um, at the same time, and they did not wish to see control of their organization. And they, they began to put in place, they saw what happened to soccer. They saw that once soccer professionalized, 
it was the clubs of Northern England who dominated the sport and, and took control of the FA Cup. And it was all of those clubs who, who competed in the Football League, not the amateur clubs of the South of England. And they didn't want to follow that path. They did not want a scenario in which their game would be given over to, to the working men. So they put in place a series of rules from the 18, late 1880s and into the 1890s in which they basically coalesced around the phrase by one president of the Rugby Football Union who said, if the working man cannot afford to play the game, he should do without it. And what that meant is there should be no expenses and there should be no broken time payment. So broken time payment means that there's a match on a Wednesday and you have to take Wednesday off to go to the game and you don't get compensated for missing your, your day's work. So the idea was that you should do this. So between 1888 and 1890, six clubs were suspended from the Rugby Football Union because in some form or another, they had given money to their players, whether as a form of, um, of suspensions or otherwise. By 1895, there had been a further 19. And then the final straw came in August 1895 when the Rugby Football Union announced that any club that was accused of professionalism was, would be suspended until they could prove their innocence. So this was the idea that this is an inversion of, inversion of the laws of natural justice. So you had to prove you're innocent, not be proven to be guilty. So you could just basically allege anything and the club would fall. And this was a final straw for a lot of those players across the north of England who met in, in Huddersfield and they formed the Northern Rugby Union, which eventually became, in, within a couple of years, Rugby League. Mm. And they didn't allow for professionalism at the start. What they allowed for was broken time payments. Okay. So it's not like they were in a mad rush to just to just set up a, a professional game. Yeah. Um, but it very quickly did then become professional and it destroyed the unity of English rugby. Now England had dominated international rugby in the home unions as they were called during this period. Um and the number but now it collapsed. So England won only thirteen of its forty eight international matches. After a, after in the early years of the of the 1900s, the number of clubs affiliated to the Rugby Football Union halved from 480 to about 240, and basically, rugby never it, rugby 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 union retreated to being a deeply middle class sport yeah. uh, associated with certain schools and certain clubs, with a few exceptions. By contrast, soccer, because it managed to maintain the unity of a professional game at elite level and then a broad-based amateur sport um, below it thrived and had 7,500 clubs affiliated by the time of the, the First World War, basically 15 times the combined total of rugby union and, and rugby league. I think it's really interesting to think, though, what would have happened if rugby had properly professionalised in, in, in the 1890s and, um, and, by contrast, what would happen if, if soccer hadn't? Mm. It's, it'd be really interesting to know what, what, what would have emerged from that. Yes, absolutely. And a brief tangent, the rules in rugby league are obviously different to union. Did that happen after the split or was it there the two traditions regardless? Well, no, the rules happened after the split. So, okay. so what they sought to do was they obviously needed to have a regular flow of income into the game when they created their rugby league. Mm. And for people to come into the game they wanted to open up the game as a spectacle so they reduced the number of players on the field from 15 to 13 to create more space they moved away from relentless the relentless rucking and mauling and, and scrums which dominated rugby during this during this period and they tried to encourage a, an open expansive and 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 passing game and in like the 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 the, the relationship between the two sports for the next hundred years was unbelievable. Uh, there, was a, there was an English rugby international in the early 1930s, a fullback on the English rugby team, who was banned from playing rugby because he met directors of a club or members of a club from rugby league. Just, just because he sat down and met them, mm. he was banned from rugby union. And this goes as stories are legion all across the game of just, uh, just this extraordinary apartheid between rugby union and, and rugby league. Because this kind of period where professionalism starts to really kick in, 1880 up to the First World War, it is in some respects remembered as a golden age for British sport. The Corinthian spirit is alive and well, but it's as professional and ruthless sounding as at the other period in, in the sporting history that we're talking about. It's an amazing thing. The people, people look back at this. Um, it, it's, a, it's an age of amateurism. 
in in one aspect of British sport and the idealism that is picked or, that is put around it and this notion of fair play and the Corinthian spirit and and the idea that sport has uh, is virtuous and has an honor onto itself mm. and the minute you scratch beneath the surface you understand the extent to which it's rhetoric there are obviously people who live by that and there were obviously people who believed in that but there were very very many more people who understood that it was it was entirely the the opposite and that um, manliness, which was trumpeted through Corinthian sport and Corinthian values, very quickly degenerated into into brutality. And there's a there's um, there's a, a great author, people might have read him from the 19th century, um, Wilkie Collins, who wrote that what sport actually does is not does it not teach you virtue. It doesn't teach you honor. It doesn't teach you integrity. What it actually teaches you is how to take advantage and be ruthless of any weakness that the person you are facing into uh, might hold, that you seek it and that you exploit it for your own end. Mm. So things, you know, to, to kind of expose some of the myths, there are things, there is crowd trouble, there is uh, violence uh, on the pitch, off the pitch, there is drug abuse, there is all the things, all the, 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 the dirty ancillary aspects of sport are alive and well in this period as well. Again, you look at Britain and Ireland, two islands united in one kingdom. It's the United Kingdom, and around the United Kingdom, these things were 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 replicated. So, gambling was everywhere, and gambling was with gambling came repeated um, kind of suggestions that there was match fixing. Mm. So there was match fixing stories in English soccer. There were match fixing stories in the GA involved. Kildare were routinely charged with very little evidence, it should be said, of 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 throwing matches, but that they were uh, ex- expected to win um, within within the within the GA. This this notion of um, violence in sport there was a massive riot in in Scotland for Rangers and Celtic in 1905 or 1907, and. And there was a a huge number of arrests, people very, very seriously injured. They had to bring in saliva testing for for horses because horses being brought in from America and from other words started to drug and and the horses didn't start to drug. Obviously, they were given the drugs, but it obviously had an impact in, in all of this. So as money, as money pushed in and washed through these sporting organizations, People sought to prosper. This is people's livelihoods. People were yeah. trying to find a way um, to make money from sport and also to win with glory, uh, because with with the the it's one of those things I suppose about amateur sport is that the glory is in the medals. It's 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 you don't get a paycheck at the end of the day, and and for the amateur, the, those those medals as wages can push people into positions. The amateur is is was far from being exempt from this world. And it's one of those things as well, from this period, you get the spurious notion of the divide between amateurism and professionalism, that professionalism became a synonym almost for competence and something being well run, whereas amateurism or amateur hour was seen as something that was shoddily run. And what we all know from even a modern appreciation of sport in Ireland, this is a nonsense mm. because there are professional administrators who have been pro- proven similarly useless, singularly useless at doing their jobs, while there are very many amateur um, administrators across a whole range of sports who are brilliant. So that alone, um, it exposes that kind of notion of a divide between the two. Okay, so then we touched on this in a few different ways. Talk to us about about class and and you know, that fed into the rugby chat. Things like rowing is a good example of a, of a point you want to make about class when it comes to sport and money. Well, if you think about it, um, the divide between amateur and professionalism is is miscast as you are one thing or another, as if there is an amateurism and a professionalism. What there are are variations of both types of of things within amateurism. There is the elitist amateurism of uh, rugby union on the one hand and a kind of a more pragmatic, loose version which the GEA has always employed. And then within professionalism, there are elite, highly paid athletes. And then there are semi-professionals who, are, who live or operate right on, on, on the margins of things. But as an example of the most extreme example of how sport was uh, constructed, in a way 
that 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 fitted into class. You must look at rowing. So the Henley, so rowing was a massive sport in 19th century Britain and Ireland, and it was something that was dominated in the early 19th century by people who worked on the boats for a living. So, for example, there were 40,000 watermen, people who worked plying goods up and down the River Thames and working in the middle of London alone. Mm. And those, it was from those people working that you began to get um, competitions for, for various um, prizes. And to be the champion rower in England, who was a professional in the early 1900s, was a huge thing. It was a, the, the person who was the champion rower of England was a star. At the same time as those professional races were going on, rowing began to establish itself in the English public schools. So places like Eton and then later on Cambridge and Oxford had developed their own rowing tradition for the boys when there were schools where, where a river flowed through or there was a river nearby and they set up a racing tradition. You see it here with Royal uh, College in Port Rory and Enniskillen um, where a similar tradition um, eg- existed. And from this tradition, you get the establishment of the boat race. Now, not the Oxford Cambridge boat race. They called it the boat race. That gives you an, an idea of where they come from. And off that, the Henley Regatta. Now, the Henley Regatta is a triumph of class snobbery in the 19th century of epic proportions. So the rules around that and of the amateur rowing association that came out of that excluded n- not just people who rowed for a living, so that is to say people who are watermen because, of course, public school boys and the professionals who came from the public schools could not be expected to compete with somebody who rode professional, at least in their own head. What they then did was they ruled out, they moved it on to being class. So you could not row with the Henley Regatta, this prestigious regatta, if you worked in and around boats or if you did any manual labor for money or for wages or if you had been by trade or employment um, a mechanic, an artisan, or a laborer, or engaged in any menial duty, or that you were a member of a boat or rowing club containing anyone liable for discrimination under any of those clauses. So, and this was applauded when this was introduced in the late 1870s and early 1880s. The Times newspaper in London applauded this, saying, with a kind of an editorial which it said, the outsiders, the artisans, the mechanics, and such like troublesome persons can have no place found for them. Uh, to keep them out is a thing desirable on every account. So, this is. Un, this is clear. This is this may be dressed up. Amateurism may be dressed up as nobility, dressed up as something that is that kind of takes money out of sport. But in the case of rowing, it is an absolute example of class snobbery and class okay. privilege. Okay, I have two last points to hit on. I want to finish on GAA and why that state amateur. But just to to, to round up the, the the basic threads and themes we've been talking about, uh, the the models you've outlined there are fairly recognisable really up until quite recently in terms of the money washing around in sport. I mean, the salary cap in football has not gone that long, I suppose, and Jimmy Hill and the Players' Union and all that. And really, what, up until maybe even mid-1980s or certainly early 1980s, take football as the example, you know, top-flight footballers, they weren't earning uh, multiples of what the man in the street was earning. They were earning good money. And we've had this almost exponential growth in the last 30 years and even more so again in the last 15, 20 years. It's just gone absolutely nuts. Uh, it, it kinda, it, we're on the precipice of something. Is it going to keep going and more and more money and it's just a, an endlessly uh, phenomenal industry and it's just immune to the, the normal rigors of the economy and it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger and more money or Or is it almost uh, reaching a point where we could have some massive implosion? It's the the current model, the explosion and the amount of money in sport is absolutely driven by by pay TV. It's absolutely driven by the fact that you can open out a sport and sell it, wrap it up as a product and sell it not just to somebody who walks, walks through a gate or somebody who buys a jersey although you keep doing those things and you can sell commercial, you sell a whole amount of commercial products around the fact that you can watch on TV pretty much everything that is available. Now in any given sport, anywhere in the world, you can see it. You can buy a subscription to it between internet based technologies or pay TV channels themselves. So sporting organizations have tapped in to um, this democratization of access to, to communications so there's nothing you cannot sell. There is the means are there to sell it now once you put the technology in place to do it. And it's all about models of scale. So if you're the NBA in America and you begin to sell your app 
where you can watch every live NBA mm. game on any given night when it when it's on, and you can sell it to not just the market in America or not just the local market of a team, but the people all around the world. And you go into eight nine billion people. That's a huge market mm. uh, to 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 build it out. And because you manage to sell a subscription to that channel, cha- channel, you also manage to get a market for merchandising. And you see people wearing LeBron James uh, jerseys on every continent in, and so on. And he's just one example, and that's just one sport as, uh, as an example. But amateurism and professionalism and the, the, where the money goes within a sport is absolutely essential to understanding it. So where does the money now in soccer go? And where does it always go? Well, the interesting thing about soccer is that it has always been a business that has ruined people as well as made people money. It's a very peculiar business. Normally, the nature of business is that you must utterly destroy your competition. Mm. You must, if you're, if, you're a, if you're little, you want there just to be little stores around Ireland because then you obviously have a captive market and you do that. But sport can't work like that. You need for your competitors to thrive to a certain extent, at least, for sport to work. And sport has, has an unbelievable capacity to make people get rid of their money, whether that's through gambling or through buying merchandising or subscribing to things or owning teams. Look at the amount of money that oligarchs spend on, on English soccer teams. Now, you may say they get this money back and they do certain ones and that they have plenty of it and it's not a loss to them. Well, I would say that Abramovich has spent a huge amount of money on Chelsea. I would say that the, the cost of running Manchester City is enormous. It may be that this is a drop in the ocean to these people, but the point is made that this is not a business that makes money mm. for those people. And, and it's a peculiar business to look at when you, when, you, when you look at soccer. So when you look at a model, when you ask the question of whether a model can sustain itself or not, you must always remember that for all that there are people who make money out of sport, there are a lot of people who put money into sport because they have it to put in. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that, so it's not a straightforward model of something exploding. Hmm. Well, it'll be interesting to see the coming decades because what we've seen in the last 10, 20 years is a kind of exponential leap, isn't it? Yes, we have seen an exponential leap and we've seen, we've seen a change. And it may be that, that it, is, it, it has reached a tipping point and it may be that the world just turns in on itself. And if you doubt that they're, like our model of sport is essentially something that has developed over 150, 200 years. Yeah. And it may change again and very easily. And if you doubt that, look at the Colosseum in Rome. The Colosseum, you could not have imagined if you were in Rome for several hundred years at the beginning of the, 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 two millenniums ago, you could not have imagined a world where the Colosseum of Rome and the great Roman Empire would not have been in existence, would not have been a focal point for that particular type of sport, mm. cruel and all as it was, mm. or barbaric as it was. You could not have imagined that. But we grew out of it eventually. And similarly, there is no guarantee. That, well, I suppose the great guarantee is that the world will, of sport will change. It's not that people won't play. People have always played. The question mm. is how they play. Yeah. The one thing that can't expand is time. There are still seven days in the week, 24 hours in the day, and people only have two eyes. They can only watch so much. They can only consume so much. And uh, I think people are increasingly becoming a bit saturated by the amount that's on TV. There's no room for much more. The only way you can make more money is if uh, people start paying more for it, I suppose. Or there's more efficient ways of distributing it and making money and, and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, the, the already... The Sky Sports model feels like it's coming to an end. Yeah, I, I, I suppose I'm really wary about saying that because people, people said in the 1930s, 1920s, the arrival of radio would kill newspapers. They said in the 1960s and 1970s, the arrival of television would kill radio and so on. All mm. of these things can, things can find a way of reinventing themselves and, 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 and moving along. And I think you have to be cautious about writing off a, a model that, that, that does just that. And I do take the point that a, one person can only watch a certain amount, but there are more and more people no, sure. are, are, uh, around the world and, and, the, and the, the manner in which the market has changed by, by a kind of a globalization of sporting access hmm. um, is, is, is really important 
when it to, to look at when it comes to the commercialization of sport and that's what that is what has driven them yeah yeah anyway that's a, a massive tangent but uh, we, we'll see we'll talk in a couple of years when bt and sky are bidding again for the premier league i just it's, it's hard to imagine they can still fork out what they're forking out um to finish then the gaa didn't go professional obviously so why not was it ever close to doing so were, were there people who felt it should well, you, you, the broader sense of it's sometimes misunderstood that the GEA's amateurism is somehow the, a, kind of a, a kind of a mutant version of the amateurism of elite English society and that the GEA took this on and that it's actually a vestige of Englishness, which is manifest through the GEA. And that just doesn't, doesn't hold water. If, if you look at the reason why the GEA didn't professionalize in the beginning, it, it, it roots itself around a couple of key facts. First of all, what the GEA envisaged was a ball-based participation sports network. That's how it saw itself. Soccer, as it did, it became very quickly, very quickly, it became a spectator-based sport uh, where elite players went into that. Yes, it is true that there were huge numbers of participants outside it, but the model was pushed towards this idea of broad bay or, or, or professional sports where, where people would compete at that level. So the GA was interested in, in broad-based participation sports. It doesn't mean that they didn't want people at matches, but it wasn't the motivation factor at the, at the beginning. Second of all, there was the practicality of how it might work. Professional sports thrived in the Connor Basins of Northern, Northern England. It thrived then in, in and around London. It thrived in the American cities in these vast, developing, industrializing urban contexts. Mm -hmm. The market in Ireland is so much smaller. The number of people in the country was falling every year, not growing. The number of people who worked in industry was hugely smaller on a percentage basis than it was in either uh, England or, or America. So the size of the market was a huge impediment to any idea of professionalization, number one. Number two, the structure of the GEA was also an impediment to um, professionalization even if some had wished to do with this very fact early that a club there would be a club scene and a county scene created the fact that it was territory based yeah. meant it took away the idea of a transfer market in, in, in large measure number one and number two the fact that in the longer run the fact that there are clubs and counties operating on the same level is really important because it means that I think personally I think that if if there was no county system and it was just clubs representing places, there would be semi-professionalism, at least in Ireland at the moment. I think of the manner in which it has operated with clubs coming together um, and forming counties, that it has just impeded that, that yeah. sense uh, that there would be professionalism. Number three, there's a rhetoric of anti-Englishness. Now, this was wrapped around all of this. This was the idea that um, if you were a professional and you played the professional sports of soccer that you were you're english and if you sought money to play that we didn't do that we were in this for something different we were in this for nationalism we believed in the gea as a project of national liberation was how it was presented so therefore now this is the rhetoric that was spun around it it's not entirely uh, convincing sure but this was the idea that if you took the saxon shilling that's you know that's what professionals did but we played for the glory of the parish we played for the glory of the county and we played ultimately for the idea of Ireland. And that created a different atmosphere around these things. So it's, it's rhetorical, it's practical, and it's about the aim of the GEA as a broad-based community organization. So those are the, the three basic factors. And I would personally say that it is the practicalities of the market uh, in terms of uh, what's capable in terms of the size of the country and the structure of the GEA, which is the greatest the greatest impediment, not the only, no, or the greatest reason for amateurism beyond it. And you must remember that it's well into its decades, it's well into the 20th century before the GEA defines what it means by amateurism. It's just kind of, kind of something that's understood. And within that space, a whole lot of things happened which go against the idea of amateurism, the strict amateurism in Britain. So rugby union won't give expenses to GA or to rugby players when they're playing games because that's not what amateurs should get. The GA did give expenses. Actually, V.S. Pritchett, the English novelist, says that the greatest word in the English language was expenses because expenses allowed you to cover through a, a multitude 
the payment of 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 cash to people, and I think we still see that and see it in see it in 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 spades. Number two, so the GA paid expenses to its players, not always particularly well, often appallingly poorly, and left people short. But the GA conceded on this idea that it, that it would do this from the start. Gambling, uh, there was gambling all around Gaelic games, and there were stories of players throwing matches and players buying matches, and this this was always there in the background. Number three, the GEA decided it would pay officials. Initially, it paid um, secretaries, various secretaries in certain areas, honorariums, and it just given them some money during the year. But that quickly became a kind of a, uh, by the early 1900s, you had a permanent secretary based in Crow Park, and that has mushroomed over uh, the years. When the GEA players went on tours, they got, were given money. They were given per diems. But more than that, unlike in rugby, when the GEA players went into collective training uh, in the uh, late 19, 19, before around 1910 and then 1912, 1914, people were, they were paid money to cover for their absence from, from work. So the lease players, when they won the 1915 All-Ireland, went for three weeks. They, they had the joy of spending three weeks living in Port Leash or Marlborough, as it was then. And workers were put in their places and they were given expenses for their trip. And it was a huge fundraising endeavor to support this. By the 1940s and 1950s, until it was banned, teams could be spending between either two and six weeks in camp, for which they were given expenses, and for which expenses were, were people were put into their work because they 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 had to they had to be covered. Also, there were ex- ex- examples of GEA players such as Tyler Mackey and Limerick having testimonials played in in their honour. The person who has written most brilliantly about this is Donald McAnallen, uh, who was kind of laid out in an article he wrote about ten years ago. Uh, just examples of how all of this was um, was happening, and then when players went to America and played in America, there was of course no pretense around anything other than you're getting a match fee. Yeah. If uh, you're a star player, you're 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 getting paid to play for a professional club, and there's gambling and drinking around those games. And um, the key though is there were two further issues that that probably limited. They kind of shaped the nature of the amateurism that was put in place. Number one, it was the use of the money to build a network of clubs. So the idea was that the GEA teams would play tournament matches and raise money, and those that money uh, would be used to 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 build grounds for players, or and sometimes to build churches or build schools, whatever. It was going into a community based thing, whereas. In its competitor sports, money was often disappearing in, 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 into pockets. Number two, officials who were themselves almost all volunteers, who gave their time to run clubs and who gave their time to run counties, were not being paid. There was a very, very far, small cadre of professional people working for Park. But beyond that, for decades, all around Ireland, volunteerism in officialdom was and remains almost essentially um, volunteer. And in a broad-based community organisation, why should you privilege one group above the others was, mm. the, was the argument that was produced. Mm. Okay, very interesting. I'm not going to get you started on Sky Sports and the GEA just on this. I'm not allowed to talk about that anymore. I'm not allowed to talk. I've, right I've, right I've, right I've right given right. commitments. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Sign contracts, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, listen, that was week seven. It was fascinating. Paul Rice, thanks so much. We'll see you next week. My pleasure, Joe. Thank you.